Well, I want to welcome you tonight to our midweek Bible study at Arbor Christian Fellowship. We're located in Lake Forest, California, on El Toro Boulevard. Uh, and uh, on Sundays, we have our worship service at 1045. If you're anywhere in that area, you're welcome to come and, and worship with us. I'm doing a sermon series called Summer Joy from the book of Philippians. The little book of Philippians is a, a letter, short letter, it's just a couple of pages in your New Testament. Uh, Sixteen times the word joy or rejoicing is mentioned. It's a, a church of joy. Some scholars even believe that it was Paul's favorite church, though, you know, you're not supposed to play favorites, but uh, the church began in a traumatic way, and I'm going to talk about that tonight in our Bible study as a prelude uh, to uh, a joy. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, book of Acts chapter 16, and uh, this is the beginning of the, the church in Philippi, and of course Paul wrote a follow-up letter years later to the Christians in Philippi, and the letter uh, was all, all over the place about joy. And the beginning of that church, uh, two things you need to know about the planting of the church in Philippi. Number one, it had a traumatic start. Uh, Paul and Silas, who started uh, the church and were put in prison, put in jail, beaten. And second thing to know is that it was the first church plant on European soil. Much of the activity in the book of, of Acts uh, at the end deals with Rome, but earlier there was no church on European uh soil. Uh, most of it was in Jerusalem area, Israel, Middle East, and what is known as Asia Minor. And that today is known as Western Turkey. Asia Minor or Western Turkey. So Paul and Silas were, were there. They started and uh, planted a, a church. And just to give you a quick nutshell before I pick apart the scripture passage and give you some relation, is Paul and Silas were in Philippi. They preached and caused a ruckus. They were arrested. They were beaten. They were put in, in jail. They were locked up. And then they were there they're there in the Huskow. The scripture says they were locked up in the inner stockade with chains up, chains up against the wall. And the scripture says that, uh, as we'll read, there was a great earthquake. Uh, they were let loose, and uh, they preached the gospel. And the jailkeeper, who was in charge of the whole thing... Uh, was going to kill himself because he was responsible for letting these prisoners escape. And that was possibly in that time and that place a death penalty. But Paul and Silas told them, hey, don't worry. They led him to the Lord. And uh, the book uh, here uh, in Acts 16 says that the story ends in joy. And so uh, that's kind of apropos for the book of Philippians. So the title of my message today, I, I've got two or three subtitles. Uh, I have a hard time eliminating things and processing things and kind of being precise and getting things to a minimum, uh, but uh, the, the overall title of the message today from Acts 16, 25-34 is Dungeon Dynamics and a Grace Escape. Dungeon Dynamics and a Grace Escape. Now there was a movie uh, I think you know what I'm getting at, called The Great Escape. And uh, it was made in 1963, The Great Escape, and it uh, featured Steve McQueen. He was on TV, who played uh, Josh Randall, I believe, in the TV series Wanted Dead or Alive. I used to watch it as a boy. That was back in the day when there was an overabundance, and as they say, a plethora of westerns on TV. I mean, you know, Sugarfoot, Maverick, Wagon Train. I mean, it just see, especially ABC. It had just back-to-back -back westerns. But uh, the Great Escape was about uh, Americans held in a Stalag in Germany, and they have a plot to escape. And of course, the stars Steve McQueen and then James Garner, uh, another TV guy that played Maverick. I, I met James Garner, and we we hung out and. I, he was fascinated about the fact that I was a Vietnam veteran, and he said he played soldiers in the movies and things. And he told me that he actually was in the Airborne in Europe and was wounded in the European theater in World War II. So he said that when he played 
the roles of a, of a soldier in movies. Uh, he, he could sense what it was like and, and the real thing. So, uh, you know, the, the movie had Steve McQueen, James Garner, Charles Bronson, and James Coburn. And all these guys were basically tough guys in the movie The, the Great Escape. Well, I'm going to use The Great Escape to talk about The Grace Escape. Okay, not Great Escape, though Paul and Silas did do a, a great escape, and a great earthquake came and set them free from the prison. But instead of running, they stayed to minister to the other prisoners, and the jail keeper had an amazing transformation. So uh, I titled this message, Dynamic Dungeon and Grace Escape. And then second title is The Traumatic Start of a Dynamic Church. A traumatic start of a, of a church in Philippi, and it's the first church plant on European soil. So those of us that have European backgrounds and things uh we can we can relate if the uh if paul and silas would have gone east instead of west then much of asia would have been christian and much of western europe might not have been christian culture and, and background so uh we see the first church plan on european soil so we're looking at the book of acts as a prelude to my study on Sundays, on the joy of the book of Philippians. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. Paul and Silas are going through Asia Minor. They felt a call to go to Europe. They had a vision of a person calling them to Europe and come over here, come over here. And so they obeyed the leading of the, of the Spirit and the sail set forth. And they ended up in Philippi. Now, Philippi uh, was an important city. Not as important as Rome or Athens. Athens was a cultural, philosophical, art, and that kind of capital of the old empire back then. And Rome was a political, military, and law. The, the jurisprudence, Roman, Roman law, and much much of the law today is based on Roman law uh, uh, principle. So uh, Paul and Silas always had the idea, Paul in the book of Acts had this vision to end up in Rome. And of course he did end up in Rome. Of course he ended up in Rome in jail and in prison and things, but he still God opened the door for him and gave him his desire to, to preach in Rome. He said, I must also preach in Rome. But they're there in, uh, in, in Philippi, and I want to I begin uh, with verse 22, uh, with verse 22 here. Uh, they're in Philippi. Uh, there was a, a demon-possessed young girl. She might have been 12, 13. Some commentators say that she was 16. Uh, hold on. Over here. Uh, but... She was demon-possessed. Paul cast the demons on her. She's there of her right mind. And a big ruckus was started because of, of what happened. And so uh, beginning in verse 22, the, the crowd rose up uh, together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their clothes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. So verse 22, Paul and Silas caused a ruckus. Uh, I once heard Leonard Ravenhill, a, a British preacher and writer who wrote the great book Why Revival Terry, say that, uh, he, and he made this statement, he, and he had truth to it, and then of course he was trying to be cute and funny. He said, everywhere Paul and Silas went, there was either a riot or a revival. Everywhere I go to preach, it's nothing but tea and crumpets. So, uh, but everywhere it seems that where Paul went, he got in some kind of trouble. So, verse 22, the crowd rose up against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Verse 23, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer. Now, keep in mind the jailer. We're going to see a, a, an astounding miracle in the life of of this jailer, and it is believed that this jailer, after Paul and Silas left, became the pastor 
of the church in Philippi, the teaching, preaching uh, pastor. Uh, when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. If a prisoner that, uh, of this kind, if they escaped, then the jailer had two outcomes, execution, or they would finish out or serve out the, the sentence. <laughs> you know, fair Roman justice. Thankfully in America, we have a semblance of, of fair jurisprudence. At least that was the intent and, and the idea. Notice that uh, they were put, uh, verse 24, and he having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and notice, fastened their feet to the stocks. They were in an inner dungeon and their feet and hands were chained to the wall. So now we get to our passage of scripture, verses 25 through 34. But about midnight, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners heard them. Now here's the thing. They're, they're in jail. They've been beaten. Their backs are probably beaten, and they're up against the wall and chains. And, you know, if there was a lot of people I know, and possibly even me, I'd have been griping and complaining Oh, God, woes me, and why did this happen, and oh, look, God, and, you know, we're suffering here. But what's the attitude of Paul and Silas? They were praying, and they were singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They couldn't one-on-one -on -one witness to them, but through their song and joy and singing uh, hymns, uh, they, were, they were witnessing. So, beginning in verse 26, and here's a beautiful thought, and suddenly, okay, and suddenly, uh, God shows up. I like the suddenly in this passage, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, not just an earthquake, it says a great earthquake, the word great in the Greek here is the word mega, mega, and of course, uh, you know, a nuclear warhead is described how, how many mega Mega tons. Uh, big churches are called what? Mega churches. Uh, and uh, I'm tempted to use the term MAGA churches. Make America great again. Churches MAGA. But uh, we'll leave that there. Suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. <laughs> What an earthquake that must have been. Such an earthquake that the chains fastened up against the brick wall falls apart. The compound falls apart. The, 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 the prisoners there, verse 27, the jailkeeper awoke. The jailkeeper awoke and saw the prison doors opened. He drew out a sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped. As I alluded to earlier, if you're a jailkeeper uh, and your prisoners escaped, uh, you would either yourself get the death penalty. Possibly uh, somebody there was under the death penalty because the jailkeeper was going to kill himself. Uh, uh, but uh, verse 28, Paul cried out with a loud voice. And I like, I like that word, loud voice. Not fanatical, not crazy mad, you know, but... Speaking truth with a loud, clear, precise, steady voice so that the jailkeeper and the prisoners could hear them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, God showed up. Verse 28, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm. We're all here. It was such an astounding thing that I think two things kept everybody there, including the other prisoners. First of all, the move of God. It, that, it, it, just something so miraculous and they're probably scared to go out thinking there'll be other earthquakes and then the fact that Paul and Silas representing God were a fulcrum and a magnet you know a, a magnet and one challenge that we can take away from this is the question is our life a magnet a magnet to draw people in when I was a young child I used to like to play with magnets and all of you have done this so you got two magnets, and then if you hit the regular polar part, they draw together. If you turn one around, they, they don't. They push out. And we are magnets for Jesus Christ to draw people in to Christ, 
to the to the message, uh, to hear our testimony, to, to hear our invitation to come to church and things. And so notice uh, the, the the jailkeeper uh, was scared. Paul cries out, verse 28, with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. What I take away from this is we as a church need to be heard in our nation. We've got all kinds of voices in our nation. Radicals, the newscasters, the news anchors, uh, the politicians, half of them are lying out of their mouth and things. And uh, we have all these voices that we hear today, a mishmash. There's one true message and one true voice, and that's the gospel. Notice once again, and I just can't emphasize the importance of this, Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. He called for the lights, rushed in, and the jailkeeper came in trembling with fear, and he fell down before Paul in silence. Now, no jailkeeper is going to bow down to the prisoners. But here he did. After he brought them out, verse 30, brought them out of the cell, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay? Number one, he asked the right question. And number two, he asked the wrong question. So, let me explain. Number one, he asked the wrong question. What must I do to be saved? That's the right question. The wrong question is, what must I do? It's not what I do. It's what Christ has done on the cross. But notice the response. After he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Paul had the idea in his mind that once they leave the jailkeeper to the Lord, that the jailkeeper is either going to win the jailkeeper's family. And because the jail was broken and they had nowhere to go, the jailkeeper was going to bring them into the home. Kind of an unusual set of happenings, wouldn't you agree? But God is at hand, and God doesn't go by human playbook. God doesn't go by human management. God is God. He does what he, he does. Verse 31, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved, you and your household. Verse 32, so beautiful. They spoke to him the word of the Lord. To him together with all that were in his house. Between verse 31 and verse 32, the scene shifts from the broken down jailhouse and prison to the home of the jailkeeper. And usually the homes of the jailkeepers were very, very close within walking distance, okay, to, uh, you know, to, the, to the prison. And then uh, they spake the word of the Lord to him together with all that were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night, and wash their wounds. Mm. Put the bad vaccine, salve, maybe bandage wrap. Uh, they, he took them that same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and only his household. And he brought them into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed with God and with his whole household. All right, let me pray. Father, as we look at this scripture and as I attempt to pick it apart and look at some truth here, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, own up our eyes. And even though we can't be in Philippi and be in a jailhouse and, uh, and things, but we can apply these principles to people all around us that are in different kinds of a prison, maybe spiritual prison, bondage of drugs or alcohol or foolishness or or bitterness, or anger, or lack of direction in their lives. So we pray, Lord God, that you'll speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Acts 16, 25 through 34. We see Paul and Silas in jail. They were jailed, but they were joyed. They were locked up, but they looked up. They were in prison, but they were praising. And the prisoners heard them. Something I see here is that no matter what their circumstance, no matter what their circumstance was, and in the bleakest hour of the night, midnight, midnight, they're rejoicing, singing praises to God, and the prisoners were listening. They were witnessing. They were testifying. Instead of saying, I want to get an attorney from Jerusalem. I have my rights. Uh, you know what? 
they surrendered to Christ and made themselves available. They made themselves available to, to God, whether the opportunity opened up or not, whether they were beaten again, uh, the opportunity opened up. So we see three things I want to go over real quickly. Uh, number one, a desperate dilemma. That's point number one in this three-point message. You know, you know, I like to do sermons with three points, four points, five points. Sometimes I'll take a point off the top of my head. You know, the, the, uh, number one, a desperate dilemma. There was, a, there's a desperate dilemma. Here's Paul and Silas serving God, loving God, doing the right thing, and instead of being honored and you know getting a certificate from the city council of Philippi and a plaque that says clergyman of the year. You know, like the plaques I got up there, I, I like them, I display them, some of them I'm ashamed of, but, you know, uh, they got a beating, they got put in jail, their backs were bruised and bloody and, and, and bleeding, and we see a desperate dilemma, a desperate dilemma. Would you not agree with me that today our nation is in a desperate dilemma? <laughs> the world is in a desperate dilemma. Our nation is in a desperate dilemma. Uh, there are people that are afraid of, of the economics. Perhaps their paycheck is their last paycheck. They don't know uh, when they go to work on a Monday if they're going to have the job or not. We, we kind of have wishy-washy things in politics. Uh, we don't know who really is running the country. I'm not going to be cute and say Satan because God is more powerful than Satan. And uh, oftentimes Satan is used by God for God's glory, and Satan gets defeated. Satan gets defeated. But we see, number one, a desperate dilemma, but number two, a divine delivery. Better said is that God just shows up. God, isn't it great on some Sunday mornings in church when God shows up? Now, you know the pastor's going to show up. You know the people are going to show up. The elders and deacons and leaders and trustees and Sunday school teachers and faithful members and some visitors are, they're going to show up. And that's wonderful, that's important. The most important is, does God show up? Mm -hmm. Is Christ in our presence? Did, did Christ show up in our church? Second, not only did he show up, can his presence be felt? Mm -hmm. And the touch of his transformation be experienced through the Bible study? perhaps through some words of the pastor in a sermon, perhaps in the fellowship, and a victory that is shared. We, yeah, we see a, a desperate dilemma, we see a divine delivery, and then third, we see a definite delight. A delight that's definite. This whole story ends in verse 34 with uh, them all rejoicing greatly, including the jailkeeper who was going to kill himself. Mm. Now imagine the tragedy, because we know he had a family. We know he had a wife and, and, uh, and, and children, he had a family. Imagine the tragedy if he had killed himself. And that's no solution. The problem is that that's something you can't come back from. If you've been hurt, you've been wounded, you're bitter and angry, quit church, you can always come back. If you have ought against the pastor or against the family or against an employee or a boss or quit or you got fired, you can, you can always get another job or, or reconcile or, or, or make it up. But once you take the option that he was going to take to kill himself, uh, verse 27, he drew out his sword and plunged it into his heart, was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Here's what's so beautiful in verse 28. So to Paul worrying about his own hide and telling Silas, okay, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. We can make it to safety. They hung around. They, they stayed around with the possibility of being transferred to another jail and being locked back up again in some other facility. But they cared for the life and the soul of the very man that whipped them and beat them. Uh, that's, that's, that's only Christ's love. Only Christ's transformation can, can do that. Uh, you know, you get revenge. I, I might have shared this one time uh, before, 
uh, I hope I don't bore you beyond tears telling me uh, telling you a personal story. But when I was a young boy, about 11 or 12, my uncle was my babysitter, my mother's brother. And my mother's brother was an alcoholic. He was uncontrollable drunk and, uh, and, and things. But he was my, my babysitter. And he lived with my grandmother and grandfather. And they were away for a while. And my mother and father would drop me off at my grandmother and grandfather's place to be babysat on a Friday night or Saturday night when they would go out dancing, go out partying or, or whatnot and things. And so my uncle would be my babysitter. I adored my uncle, and I wanted to be like him. I thought he was the coolest guy in the world, my uncle. But he was a drunk. He was a drunk. And I remember one evening, he brought me into the kitchen. He brought out the kitchen table from the dining set, and he tied me to a chair in the middle of the kitchen, tied me to a chair. He got a bunch of bourbon and whiskey bottles out. He put a funnel in my mouth. My hands were tied to the chair. He put a funnel in my mouth and he started pouring the bourbon and the whiskey down my gullet. And what he said was, I know I'm an alcoholic and your mom hates me because of that. Your father hates me because I'm a drunk alcoholic. I know what I am, but you know what? I'm going to make you one too. And I, so I, 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 I remember like it was yesterday, he put the funnel in my mouth and started pouring the bourbon and then another bottle of whiskey down my throat. Of course, I was gagging and huffing and, and puffing and things like that. And I just thought to myself, what in the world is, is going on? Mm -hmm. And I was too weak and not strong enough yet to fight. And so I just took it. and. Uh, after it was all over, my uncle untied me, and uh, I, I went into you know the, the, the guest room uh, where I'd stay if it was an overnighter. And that night, I was very disturbed, very angry, and I said that when I get old enough, when I get 17 or 18, I'm going to kill, I'm going to murder my uncle. Sure, blood relative, sure, my mother's brother, but I said, I'm going to kill him. And I meant it. I, I meant it. I, I, I was serious. So, to make a long story short, and forgive me for personal illustrations, I do want to get back into the glory of God's actual word. Uh, when I was 17 and got a little bigger, uh, of course, you know, fighting a drunk that couldn't help himself. We, he got into a fist fight. I was going to kill him. And I beat him. And then I said to myself, what am I doing? This is wrong. What am I doing? This, this is wrong. And just left it at that. And when I went in the Marine Corps, my uncle was afraid of me. <laughs> I can't blame him. Those of you that have been in the military, you know some of the training you get and things. He was always afraid of me. Later on in life, when I came back from overseas, we sat down and I told my uncle, hey, I love you. I forgive you for what you did to me with the funnel. It's all ancient history. I'm not going to do anything to you. You don't have to be afraid of me. And I told him, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'm forgiven of my sin, and you need to accept Christ as your Savior. And he told me, he said, I can't. I've done too many bad things. I, and and uh, I says, it's not only alcohol, it's drugs. I've been selling drugs, pushing drugs, and this... There's no way God can forgive me. And I said, I said, yes, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Uh, a few nights, my uncle died. He drunk himself to death. He, my mother, of course, was beside herself, even though he was the, the black sheep of the, of, of the family. And uh, as I look back now, uh, perhaps in a strange roundabout way, my uncle did me a favor, because ever since then, I've hated the taste of alcohol, even wine, even some, you know, I mean, I just, I can't tolerate it. So maybe it was God's way of keeping me from myself becoming a hopeless drunk, a wino, and this and that. Uh, God works in mysterious, in mysterious ways. But I forgave him. It was sincere. It was genuine. And the last month of his life, we got along, got along real well. And then one night, 
you know, I go over to there, and there he is, dead on the floor in a pool of his vomit, dead. That's why I hate alcohol. That's why I, I hate alcohol. And uh, oh, that, well, getting back, uh, we see here a desperate dilemma, a divine delivery, and a definite delight. A definite delight. They were beaten, and they forgave the jailkeeper that had beaten them. Let me close this door. A couple of other, other things that uh, we see here. Uh, Paul and Silas were in tandem. Mm -hmm. It's always good for a believer to have a prayer partner and even a witnessing partner. Uh, for a while, Rick Warren, some of you have heard of him, and uh, we were prayer partners and witnessing partners. And uh, I can tell you, in, when we were at Cal Baptist College in Riverside, uh, back in the mid-70s as students, I can't tell you the number of times we were apprehended by the police on the streets of Riverside for disturbing the peace. What were we doing? We were handing out tracts. And occasionally I'd do a little street preaching, and then Rick and I determined to be prayer partners, so we would meet for one, cement, one full year of, of school. I was a senior, he was a sophomore, but we'd meet every morning before morning dinner, uh, and we, we'd spend time in prayer together. And I believe a lot of the witness and success Rick has had in ministry and pastoring and people through that church coming to Christ and the great missions that uh, emanate from those times of praying. Uh, I remember as we knelt early in the morning and we, we determined to meet at 5 o'clock in the morning. Of course, being a former active duty Marine, uh, 5 o'clock's nothing. U.S. Marines do more things before 5 o'clock in the morning than most people do all day, so to speak. But uh, I, Rick and I, we had separate prayers. Rick prayed at, that, Lord, use me to pastor a big and a great church that wins a lot of people to the Lord. My prayer was different. My prayer was, Lord, use me and send me all over the world to teach and preach the gospel all over the world. And God answered both those prayers. Uh, God answered both those prayers. So what I'm trying to say is that there was Paul and Silas. It's easier to partner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a husband and wife, a couple, mm -hmm. that partner. Sometimes it's mutual friends, and there's a partnership there. There's a partnership there. Mm -hmm. So uh, no such thing as the Lone Ranger mindset in Christianity. As a young boy, I used to watch Westerns, and one of my favorites was, of course, the Lone Ranger and his horse, and what was it? Hayo Silver away, and then of course Tonto, uh, Kimosabi. I say all of this because every Christian needs a Kimosabi and a Tonto, a partnership of some kind. And that's one of the purposes of the church, the fellowship, the partnership. I couldn't have made it as a pastor if it was just me. No such thing as a lone ranger Christianity. Hmm. And a lot of people are like that, and unfortunately, they stunt their spiritual growth. So we see Paul and Silas in partnership, but we also see them in prayership. Verse 25, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. That's the first thing. They, they were praying. They were praying to God, and God heard them, and God answered. But the prisoners also heard them, and the prisoners might have been shell-shocked to hear these two guys Innocent, they didn't commit the kind of crimes that the others that were in the Huskow committed. They were just, I'm not going to say the term Baptist preachers, they were preachers. But instead of hearing them complain and gripe and woe is me, they were praising, they were singing hymns, they were, they were praying. They might have been praying for the very prisoners mm -hmm. that had met. I mean, that's, that's going to shake you up a little bit there. But uh, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Mm. And they had an audience. The prisoners heard them. Next thing uh, is also oftentimes God works in the suddenly. God never does anything too early or too late. Mm. It's one of the hardest lessons for a lot of us that serve God to learn. I, 
I, I've had my times of being impatient, you know, with God. And I've jokingly said, and you've heard me say it before, I used to have this prayer, and it went like this, okay? I, I don't want to startle you with my voice, but I pray, God, give me patience and give it to me now! <laughs> but aren't we, aren't we like that sometimes? And uh, we need to learn to wait upon the Lord, to, to wait upon the Lord. Uh, so Paul and Silas were praying. Uh, they were partners in ministry. But look at verse 26. Suddenly... God works his timetable. Never early, never late. God's always on time. That's such an important lesson for us to learn. We see this traumatic start of a dynamic church in Philippi, a church known for joy. At the start of it, it wasn't all that joyful. We see dungeon dynamics. You can have dynamics and praise and hymns and praying and and uh, even in a dungeon, even in a dark, deep, dank dungeon, dungeon dynamics, and best of all, the grace escape. Not like the movie, The Great Escape, but the grace, God's grace showed up. And the whole thing ends up with them rejoicing. As I said, they were locked up, but they were looked up. They were jailed. But they were joy. They were in prison, but they were praising. And no matter what circumstance we face today, mm. or face tomorrow, mm. or, you know, in a couple of days, uh, something's going to come down, or this week you got a phone call that was somewhat disturbing. No matter what, no matter what desperate dilemma you may be going through, or you viewing at home in this study, maybe some financial struggle, maybe a marital struggle, maybe problems with your teenage kids. Maybe you had to bail when your teenage children out of juvie last week or this past week or some other, other situation. Uh, there's always hope. Never, ever, ever give up. No matter what desperate dilemma you're in, God has a divine delivery that ends up with a definite delight. Notice the whole thing ends with them rejoicing greatly and then believing in God, the whole household, the whole family. It's amazing that Paul didn't cut and run. Now, I don't know what I would have done. It's, you know, it's easy for me to get all huffy and puffy and pontificating and preacher talk. Yeah, I'd have done that. I don't know. I might have just run for safety and forget it and leave it. But, uh, you know, Paul and Silas were doing business for God. And what is our business for God? Hmm. Salt and light. Salt is a preservative. By the way, salt was like money back in those days. You could, you could use money, uh, salt as money, as a medium of change in some areas. Uh, bartering, it was called bartering and, and things. We're, we're, we're salt. A uh, couple of things about salt that you and I know uh, one of the things that I've been laughed at and ridiculed, and it happened once at a potluck uh, with one of our dear ladies, uh, not in this church, of course, uh, uh, but in our previous church at the potluck, we had a plate of mashed potatoes and things, and I got the salt shaker and just put salt over it, and the sweet lady just said, Pastor, you didn't taste your mashed potatoes. You salt it without tasting it? And I said, uh, well, yeah. I says, no matter what, it's not going to be enough salt anyway. So I need to put salt on, trying to make light of it and, and things. That, so she was innovating and talking later that I was reckless. Of course, she was right on. In my younger years, uh, you know, I, like, I could be reckless in, 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 in some ways and, and, and whatnot. And uh, uh, I still got a long ways to go and a long ways to grow. And so we got it. All right. Well, I'm just about done. Let me wrap it up here. Let me wrap it up. Two, two last closing shots. And uh, in pitching, uh, the pitcher either throws a flutter ball or a knuckle ball or a curve or a high, hard one fastball. So my two closing pitches are hard, high one fastballs aimed at the head to get it in our brain. Number, number one, Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. The rest of the story, they rejoiced greatly. They rejoiced greatly. That's pitch number one. Pitch number two, in closing, we hear a lot today in the news about being woke. Being woke. 
you know what I mean? Being, being woke, notice that jail keeper was awoken uh, out of his sleep. Look at verse 27. When the jailer awoke, here's the right kind of woke, hearing and knowing God's truth, coming to Jesus Christ, rejoicing greatly. He followed the Lord in a believer's baptism. And notice two things. Service. He washed the stripes uh, there. Service. Ministered to the needs of another believer and uh, baptized. And uh, he was part and parcel of the church in Philippi. Believed he was the pastor. Uh, to Paul and Silas uh, encouraged and all of that. So what a great and, and wonderful story. Dungeon Dynamics and the Great Grace Escape. Let me pray. Father, Take these words and bless it upon our hearts and minds. Lord, we can't be in a Philippi dungeon, but in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our home, uh, where we are, in the marketplace, wherever, we can be salt and light. We can be woke. We can be part of the rest of the story of rejoicing greatly. And Lord, if we're going through a desperate dilemma, we anticipate your divine delivery and the definite delight that comes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School. We have Vacation Bible School, by the way, if you're in the area. Uh, we're Arbor Christian Fellowship, Lake Forest, Irvine, Mission Viejo area. Our address is uh, Lake Forest. We are between, we are between Muirlands and Rockfield. Uh, on El Toro Boulevard. So, Vacation Bible School starts July 18. July 18, Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 12 o'clock. Bring your children. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful uh, time for them. God bless you. Sunday, be with us, view us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.